Okay, and we are live, so here we go. Hello, I am Joseph Aleo, and you are listening to Mage the Podcast. This is the show where we talk about all things Mage-related. And our guest on today's show is Bill Maxwell. He's the co-author of the tradition book, Virtual Adepts. And he also has adapted Raymond Feist's Rift Roar Universe to video games. He's written story and dialogue for Star, uh, Star Trek IPO and has worked on a number of role-playing games for companies such as Mattel, Sony, and, of course, White Wolf. Bill Maxwell is also the grandson of acclaimed screenwriter Ernest Pagano and actress Norma Drew. And I think that is an excellent way to start this interview. Bill, welcome to Mage the Podcast. Good morning. Glad to be here. Great. Now, um, I assume being the grandson of two very creative people had an impact on you as a writer, especially for role-playing games. Very much so. Um, my, I never met my grandfather. He died far before I was born, but his presence was everywhere in my mother's life. Um, and his movies were <laughs> shown to me quite a bit when I was growing up. And my grandmother, who I did know um, very well, she had many stories about what it was like to be on stage and in early Hollywood. So I have to admit, before this interview, I was not familiar with your grandfather. What are some of the, uh, the movies he has worked on? He was the Fresh Air Ginger Rogers um, oh. crowd. So You Were Never Lovelier. Um, <laughs> that's funny. This, the second big one doesn't come to my, into my mind. The only thing that pops in my mind is uh, the plot. Um, which is the an American jazz performer pretending to be a Russian ballet dancer for fame and fortune, but falls in love with an American jazz female on a cruise, and then things go uh, terribly, terribly awry, as these things do. Lots of yeah, dancing, lots of comedy. <laughs> that is an era where you could have a movie set on a cruise. That doesn't really happen so much anymore. <laughs> Not so much. So you said your grandfather's presence was felt everywhere in the house. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you paint us a picture about that? He was a – loved people and was a master of humor. So we had a collection of joke books that he had compiled, which at that time was the largest collection of jokes in the world. Uh, now with the internet, that is <laughs> such a small achievement. <laughs> oh, energy, yeah, I can get those. But at the time, it was, you know, multiple books. Um his screenplays, watching you know his uh, his movies, listening to stories about how he lived in old Hollywood. Uh, back in that time, a lot of it was a contract, so you'd you were basically paid to work for a studio on whatever they wanted for however they wanted. So a lot of a uh, lot of impact in that. And my parents lived to, uh, originally in a lot of different houses before I was born, so there were pieces of those houses that he had you know, brought forward. I mean, it sounds strange, but, you know, a vase from here and a prop from here. Oh, <laughs> so. all right. I see. So I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you said he wrote a lot of jokes. Is there one that you recall? Oh, no, sadly. Um, I wish I did off the top of my head. All right. Well, fair <laughs> enough. So, okay. So let's get back to the original question, though. How did this translate into you being a writer and a writer for role playing games? What influence did they have on the way you write or approach games? Um, I fell in love with the theater. And even though I, I didn't end up in front of the, um, uh, you know, on stage as often as I wanted, um, that, that kind of never left me. It was kind of the, the, the path my, my grandmother had been on. Um, originally, when I was looking into writing, I was looking to write into comic books. Um, but because of my grandfather's tradition, my younger brother, he pulled me over to try to write screenplays. Um, and so we were, we were writing screenplays together for a short while. Um, and <laughs> this is Hollywood. So everybody in Los Angeles has a screenplay. So at that time it didn't go that far, but that sensibility of trying to write screenplays, trying to look into it when, when all of a sudden somebody says, you know, Hey, can you do, you know, role-playing games? Can you write where where many people have to figure out different ways to go? That just kind of it translated straight into it. I know that might sound a little strange. No, I think that translates. But, you know, I'm curious. Uh, Satiris Procrado is the co-creator of Mage. Uh, I know that he has a background in acting in college. I don't know if you two had an opportunity to talk about acting and, and screenplays. 
No, we 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 came across e- each other's paths um, much later. Okay. Um, my my entry into that world actually came through. You were talking about um, Starfleet Academy, and I ran into the White Wolf crew um, via that project, which is a very strange place to meet your heroes. Okay. Well, let's like, like let's explore that a little further. So you mentioned that writing screenplays led to role playing games. Could you actually take us back in time and how and explain to us how that happened? Um. Oh. It's going to be complicated. <laughs> Go for it. We have all the time in the world. <clears throat> all right. So when I was very young, um, we're talking middle school back in that time, or junior high, as they used to call it back then, um, I was in a professional choir, uh, a touring choir. So went across the U.S., sang a lot of songs. And in the downtime, um, a couple of the youth there were playing this strange game that was brand new, that was forbidden by all the parents because it will lead to Satan and evil. And that game was called Dungeons and Dragons. Yes. And it was, it was <laughs> a terrible thing, and nobody should ever play it. It was, oh, God. But, you know, that piqued my interest is, what the heck is this? By the time I got to high school, I was looking into it, and I was making maps, and, you know, part of the... <laughs> Let's just say when I when I saw the show Stranger Things, I'm like, oh, I recognize those people. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> Up to getting on the bike and going home, you know, in Los For Angeles. Sure. So it's not as creepy, but <laughs> <laughs> um, that translated to you know, in in college, I experienced and tried a bunch of of you know of these role playing games because I was living near Berlin Game, and that was where they had. Um, a couple of the designers who did uh, Danger International was the name of the game. was a spy game. A um, couple of the other generic world systems like that um, was actually at a Berlin game near San Francisco. And I happened to go to college near there. So there was a designer who, who dropped in and who used college students to help him write stuff. Um, and that's when I found out that at that time I was a terrible player and got myself kicked out of his gaming group. Um delightful way to to end up making yourself into a game master when you can't play with anybody you're like okay fine i can't play i'll try and run things this led to me getting out of uh college and running dungeons and dragons at a gaming store uh where they handed me anything that was related to to new games for free and i ran across vampire the masquerade uh brand new at the time Crazy, crazy game. You know, was there was nothing like it out there. Um, our crew fell in love with it and spent about, a, I think, a year trying to figure out how to play it. And that led us to running one of the first Vampire Los Angeles games, or Vampire LARPs in Los Angeles. And that led us to a convention. <laughs> and then we were running convention games. And from a convention game, because I knew how to do screenplays, because I was running convention games... Um, that pulled me into the video game industry from running into a producer at a convention LARP. That is fantastic. And the very, very second game, second game I, I professionally did was Star Trek Starfleet Academy, working with Daniel Greenberg from the Werewolf crew at that time, uh, and ultimately with Bill Bridges and Andrew Greenberg. Oh, I see. Which is... <laughs> Long story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to go back to, to something sure. you mentioned. You said that you were kicked out of a game because you were a terrible player. Why were you such a terrible player? There was I was a terrible player at the time because of, um, well, and it's something I got to say that I have been thoroughly enjoying with the most modern games out there. Uh, the modern games have done a great insistence on Gaming is a cooperative tool. It's a bunch of friends getting together and having a good time. And at the time when I approached gaming, um, I approached gaming with a with a sense of, ah, it's a game. You have a goal. You have to achieve this goal. And I didn't pay attention to the other people in the gaming group around me. I didn't make sure that their time was the best time. Uh. And it was that lesson, uh, the lesson of arrogance. Um, that pulled me when I started game mastering. Um, that was my absolute key. Was they need to have a satisfying time. Um, 
And uh, you know, I learned I learned on pretty pretty early on that in in an individual game, there's often somebody who doesn't have a good time, who doesn't have the best time. You know, it could be something as simple as they had a bad day, and they come into the game and the game doesn't cure the bad day. But over the course of several different games, you can always turn the spotlight on somebody, and you can make them feel worthwhile and valued, and and they will remember the games in total as that, and then they'll have a powerful experience on their life. You know, oh, wow, you know, I had a really bad time then, but if you keep at it, hey, life improves. You know, I've got to agree with you, and one of my big revelations, because I just recently got back in role-playing games about two years ago, and it's good to be back, but we had one adventure where it was me and my friend, and uh, it was his hero scene, and I had the opportunity to join in at any point and, and save his bacon, but I thought, you know what, this is his time to shine and so for three hours i just let him play out the scene and only came in at the very last moment because i'm like you know what i want this guy to be the hero i'm not going to ruin it for him and that was something of a revelation for me i think as a younger man i would have jumped in first thing oh yeah and i can tell you that's a mistake because <laughs> <laughs> i've done that and i think that resulted in me getting shot with something like 500 rounds of ammunition <laughs> the, the game master was not happy with me at the time all right, so before we get into virtual add-ups, I'm curious. We're all adults now. We're all busy. We have a lot of distractions, a lot of worries and concerns. Do you still play rolling, playing games, or are you more of a designer and creator at this point? I, well, it's, it's funny. Yes, I, I, do, I do still run role-playing games, but right now I run them for my kids. Oh, so much fun. What are you playing? So um, what I did is I took the, the, the Star Trek game that I wrote, uh, Star Trek Starfleet Academy, and uh, turned it into a game for them using the Savage World system. And uh, in brief, it's a story of a, a set of students um, that are supposed to be a command crew on a on a ship. So they're at Starfleet Academy, and as they're going through, and this was one of the joys of being behind the scenes is Star Trek Starfleet Academy was produced by one of my oldest friends, Rusty Buchert. And so between he and I and the other designer, um, uh, the other designer is the uh, astonishingly talented Scott Benny. Um, but uh, he and Scott Benny came up with this incredible, truly Star Trek plot about these, you know, this argument where, you know, one set of the Star Trek utopian ideas go out there and explore. And then the other idea was was very much a the villains of the piece where if you go out there and explore, you're exposing yourself to horrible, horrible danger with billions mm. of people killed. We need to make... Um, Earth first. Earth needs to be the priority <laughs> before anybody else. And their original concept was very a very nuanced argument that that a lot of it got out, but not as much. There was a, a writer who was not me who was called in in uh, at the latter part of the project, which muddied the waters some. But their original idea was so clear, and so that's what I've been running with with my kids to give them that kind of. Um, that kind of argument where the villains aren't quite the villains. I mean, the villains or the 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 uh, the villains have a great point, <laughs> well, especially given in the, in the Star Trek universe. Yeah, yeah, and, that's classic and Trek. Slowly running through that with some um, uh, some great, you know, the simulator adventures, and they've been having a great time. And we've been actually running it on and off again with God. It's been about twenty or twenty of their friends, I think, all total, have gone through different parts of it for like three years now. <laughs> Oh my God, that's fantastic! So it's been it's been fun, and okay, I'm, really... I'm moving back towards getting uh, getting back into playing. So hopefully, I will be game mastering some stuff in the next few months. Okay, I promise we're going to talk about virtual adepts in a second, but I've got <laughs> one more question to ask. No problem. Um, okay, so I'm putting together a uh, a setting myself, and it's more of a, a post apocalyptic scenario. And I've been weighing the pros and cons of different game mechanics. I thought maybe Fate, maybe Savage Worlds, maybe GURPS. And you mentioned that you're using Savage Worlds, and I was curious about that because I noticed that a lot of people who do Star Trek adventures, it's usually Fate. So why did you settle on Savage Worlds? Uh, well, part of it is is at the time I, I knew, well, and still know, Sean Patrick Fannin um, and wanted to experience um, you know, the setting that he had helped support. Um, and 
Savage Worlds, in this particular case, it's running very well for the the kind of simulator adventures and things they want. The kind of the high paced adventure of um, uh, of the Academy experience. You know, when you when you whenever something's happening, it's happening fast. Um, for a more thoughtful scenario, I probably would go with Fate. Okay. Um, yeah, but the, the, that's been the joy of a lot of the games that have been created recently. Is is I mean, well, it, 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 like a different experience, Ten Candles, which is um, a horror game. I, I don't know if you're familiar with it. No. The, the mechanics of it is, is you've got ten candles around uh, the table, and it's a survival horror where in the end everybody's going to die. And you play until you lose a roll, and then one of the candles is blown out. And then when all the candles are gone... You're done with the game. The, there's the final scene where the last person is is killed, um, and that mechanic lends itself to a very specific kind of tension. Um, fate lends itself to a specific kind of tension. Savage Worlds. I mean, it's it's wonderful how these these specialized games are are taking this and um, and just allowing you to to breathe and to to design scenarios in so many wonderful ways to just hit specific emotional notes okay well i've never heard of 13 candles and now i'm gonna have to google that and it also <laughs> reminds me of games where they use uh jenga to add suspense and tension to games mm -hmm. okay so we're here of course to talk about the tradition book virtual adepts which you co-wrote with gary glass and this is actually the revised edition of the tradition book so how did this project come together and what direction were you and Gary given to revise the virtual adepts? Um, well, they knew that they needed to do a serious update. I had done some work for Bill Bridges and his team on um, Fading Suns, on the Fading Suns Passion Playbook, which is their LARP system. So they were well aware of me, well aware of the of the um, stuff that we had done with the the convention work. Starfleet Academy, working with them on Fading Suns. Um, and they were looking for a severe re revision on um, virtual adepts because they were well aware that it was very, very much rooted in the 90s and that a lot had changed. And they wanted to see, especially with the Ascension War, um, what direction it would, it would go. And that was Gary and I were discussing our ideas on it. Gary was um, uh, is a friend of mine and also uh, one of the one of my older players in my games. So it was a delight to be able to work on with him in professional capacity. Um, but um, we had discussed the idea of, of of you have the virtual adepts as part of the technocracy, but they're always placed in there as kind of the new kids on the block. And we wanted to give them some weight and some heft, and that's where the idea of introducing the heavy mathematics came in. Um, other than that, they, they, they really didn't give us many mandates that I remember, barring please update this um, and make it relevant to today. Well, I, I think this is something that we have to explore here because, as you said, uh, they came out of the 90s, and I think we have to explore the context because... Some people, they were kids in the 90s, or maybe they were just born uh, as millennials. Um, I really look back on the 90s with a lot of fondness. I, I don't know if I felt that way at the time, uh, but when I think about all the potential, all this excitement, like, oh, the 21st century is happening, it could be anything. And so I think the virtual adepts represent that side. So could you give us some context, please? Part of it is, is they have the the old adage, the cyberpunk adage of um, information uh, wants to be free. Right. And especially when you have the advent of the internet, you know, the internet, you get flooded with information. And at some point you start to realize that information means nothing without context. Um, in fact, it was an argument that I made in a separate publication, Fading Suns. Um, we're writing on, on why uh, this particular church didn't like technology. And one of the arguments I had was how propaganda works in an information-rich environment is you flood it. You flood it, flood it, flood it with as much stuff as you can and then make yourself the loudest person in the room. 
And because you're the loudest, you will rise above the noise and you'll be considered to be the truth. Um, and that's, that's very prescient. Yeah, it's it's been it's it's really been proven <laughs> over and over again. The other thing is is a lot of the cyberpunk aesthetic that that they were um, the virtual addicts were pulling from was yes from the nineties, but more from the eighties and kind of the the cynicism, the Blade Runner esque kind of thing that 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 arose from from that decade, which was far less pleasant than. <laughs> than the uh, exuberance of the 90s. Um, and those aesthetics needed to be updated as well. You know, kind of pull away from the cyberpunk a little bit and peel that back. Um, and even in early 2000s, I mean, the question was is whether that kind of exuberance would last into the 21st century. You know, well, things, things... Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, sadly, as yeah, we know what the outcome was. Um, well, you know, I, I think I said this that um, the, the excuse me, the technocratic union and the virtual adepts are two sides of the same coin. I did not know that the virtual adepts started as cyberpunks. As I said, I only just got back in role playing game about two years ago, so I always thought the virtual adepts is being more into transhumanism and and and. Uh, um, extropians and things like that. So it sounds like you were given a lot of creative reign. So what are some of the other ideas you wanted to explore? I wanted to explore, well, part of it is is when you read, um, there's a comic book author and, um, <laughs> and magician, um, Grant Morrison. Yes. And when you start reading deeply into the invisibles and things like that, you start wanting to find out, you know, or even Alan Morris Promethea, you, you want to start getting into deeper themes, um, what's behind the curtain, but not in a way that, you know, all of a sudden, oh, everything's related. Yeah, sure, but we're talking about the virtual adepts here. What's related to them? And, and it's very easy to find links with numbers and their significance and the significance of the context of numbers. You know, this number relates to this, which creates this impression. Um, and, you know, I'm not... Uh, it's funny because I'm not a math nerd myself. Um, I'm 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 scared of mathematics. <laughs> I love <laughs> Me too, but I love connections. And and this just felt like way that um, I wrote a book, um, Shadow Path. And in one of the sections of the book, we dig deep into Pythagoras. Uh, he was known as the Pythagorean theorem. What is not known is he actually had an entire mystery school. Um, designed to using math and color, I believe, to uh, create magic and warp the world. <laughs> and Pythagoras, of course, is used. I mean, the, the the idea of mathematics is used. It's the foundation of a lot of what the technocracy is about. And the idea that you know the the the, the virtual adepts took the crazy part of Pythagoras and ran with it. You know, all these other um, uh, really odd. I mean, when you when you start uh, delving into Turing's work, and the people he worked with, and the fringe stuff that he worked with on the side, I mean, it he, or even Tesla, <laughs> um, all these all these people, it's you you see their impact in with with what we call the technocratic inventions, and then you see all the stuff that's that people have left behind that's that's really fascinating, um, all the magic bizarreness. Um, I, I, sorry, it's a, a great example. It's, it's it's actually not in the virtual adepts uh, source book, but it's a, it's a, it's a fun example because um, there's a series out now about him, Jack Parsons. Are you familiar oh, yes. with this? I've been a fan. Well, I I can't say I'm a fan of Jack Parsons, but I'm fascinated <laughs> with Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard and Crowley. That whole connection yeah. is fantastic. So so for for those who who do not know, in brief, he because uh, he actually did his work within spitting distance of my house. Um, <laughs> so um, he was a well-esteemed, incredible rocket scientist who did lots and lots of great work for the Jet Propulsion Laboratories and you know the precursors for NASA, all sorts of, of things like that, who was also running massive orgies and um, into um, all sorts of ritualistic magic. <laughs> on the side up to including driving up to the Mojave to uh, cast a huge ritual to summon a primal goddess into the Los Angeles area. As you do. 
Yeah. So it's <laughs> it's it's people like that where it's like you look at it and you go, how did you get from here to there? And and you kind of pull that into how a virtual adapt with the use of this computer, which I, one of the things that having grown up in in the era where where computers became a thing, um, so much of our mental state at the time in the 80s was we were doing these things like Dungeons and Dragons, which made us feel accepted. We were no longer nerds or geeks or anything like that. We were somehow bound by these games. And then we had this incredible communication technology. And we wanted to be able to share that with the world. And this is this is all real world stuff. This is this is us, you know, sitting down in the 80s going, God, man, if only we could talk to other people and, and show them, you know, how cool it is to do this. And then to watch that entire reality expand into today when I remember, you know, people trying to throw me into a trash can because I read they found me reading a comic. And nowadays, you know, they're they're going, oh, have you heard Sandman is being potentially produced as a series? That's so exciting. And you're like, going, dude, you didn't even know who Sandman was back when Vertigo started to produce that that comic. But now it's mainstream, and that's that's the adept dream. It's it's bringing the craziness, you know, the, all the side stuff up to the forefront. Yeah, it's a very exciting time to be alive. But you know, there's a little bit of a dark side to this because the virtual adepts use tactics like doxing or calling online bounties, which now have become tools of the alt right. So I imagine you must have some complicated feelings about that. Yeah, especially since part of my. Um, uh, <laughs> Part of part of some of the stuff I do in the real world is is deal with alt right folks. So, up to and including working security to keep them out of events and working security to keep them out of online events. So, it's it's interesting. But the the virtual adepts have always had that that darkness even even before the doxing. And I think that's kind of part of their leftover from the from the technocracy. Um, and it's easy to go that. I mean, it's it. it it's nothing that is specifically presented in the books, but the reality of it is people have a very difficult time um, if they think the world should be unified and they run into something that is radically different. Um, Grant Morrison handled that by by having individual worlds, um, you know, be, be populated by people. Uh, and the virtual adepts that kind of, you know, kind of have the same idea. Um, but it's that it's that sense of unity which can send you down that path of oh you're not like me well fine now I'm going to shame you I'm going to expose you I'm going to do all these horrible things to you um, and you know that's always been the case of people who have too much power so I'm not sure if that answered your question but it's <laughs> yeah well, it me... does it does disturb me <laughs> well let me ask you this then. If you were to have another stab at updating the virtual adepts for the 21st century, what would you change and what movements do you think they would align themselves with? My, my honest uh, opinion of the um, virtual adepts in the in 21st century is they would be – a lot of the enthusiasm you'd see in, in this book would be kind of reversed. They're currently in a losing battle against somebody they never expected to lose against. Um, and that's the syndicate. Mm. The big thing that they've always looked out uh, against is you You always look at... Um, uh, uh, it's one of those times where my brain decides... I mean, the New World Order is one. Um, and, of course, my brain has decided to forget the ones who... Oh, Iteration X. Thank right. you, brain. <laughs> those... <laughs> Those are the two that, that, that they would always feel that those are those are the easiest ones that are against them. You've got observation, you know, or um, surveillance technologies, and you've got um, straight up technology itself. Um, those are their automatic enemies. But if you really look at it nowadays, um, surveillance systems, while they are endemic and everywhere, are overwhelmed with data. Um, in real life, for example, I had a couple of FBI agents pop up at my door about a month ago. Whoa. Um, because of something I'd written on the internet, which you look at it in, in, in 20 seconds, you can determine that it is satirical and that it does not match the definition of, of producing harm against anybody. 
Uh, and in fact, in the comment section, that's even made explicit um, because I'm a writer and I know what I'm writing down there. However, because the system is overwhelmed, it kicked it out and humans had to go check it out. And that's pretty much with a lot of the surveillance technologies. In technology, people are finding that a lot of tech breaks and breaks easily and gets screwed up, except for some really simple stuff like, you know, your phones, phones are everywhere, which is more the virtual adepts realm than it is it X. So if you look at that, if you look at, you know, virtual adepts versus it X versus um, um, the new world order, the virtual adepts win, hands down. Um, you know, much more people are going to go watch um, the Avengers than they are going to be concerning themselves with, you know, the latest evil person next door. They'll they'll try and leave that in somebody else's hands. But the syndicate, everybody, everybody wants money and considers money to be the thing that they must have in order to continue. So it's the, hey, you know, wow, I've, I've got this YouTube channel. I can talk about anything. And then there's this little voice. Do you know how you can monetize that? Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, what, is this initial dream of I'm going to share my thoughts and my creativity with the world is, well, damn, I'm not getting enough clicks with this. Um, uh, uh, hey, how about I do something outrageous like, you know, visit a, a Japanese suicide forest. That'll get me clicks. You know, and then they're betraying things and, you know, and destroying magic in the world. And everybody goes, ah, they're just doing it for the money. And the virtual adepts are losing that war. I mean, losing it hands down. Um, you can even see that reflect if you want to reflect it in, quote, real life in the gaming companies where their people are being worked to death with uh, incredibly long crunch times that never end. Uh, something you do not see as bad in Hollywood, which is saying something since Hollywood is really bad at trying to work people to death. So I would focus, if I was to do a revision, that would be the focus is this was not something they expected. Um and, and that's how they're losing the Ascension War. You know, I think you just give a bunch of people ideas for their next chronicle. <laughs> well, I'm glad for that. <laughs> yeah, at least something positive came out of that. All right, so I have a couple of questions from our new co-host. His name is Terry Robinson, and he would like to know whose idea it was to create the T-Virus. That was mine. All right. So where did the idea come from? Um... The question was, it was, it was, it was basically it was to honor um, what had gone before, and then to be able to expand their role. So, in the original presentation of the of the tradition books, or even the tradition, the first edition, you know, they came up with a we're a, we're a young culture, we're brand new. Yes, we ran with the technocracy back when this was all young, but the minute we saw our technology take off, then you know. Boom, we had to run with the Sons of Ether. We had to, to cut our losses. And we didn't want to lose that history, but we wanted to be able to expand on it. And then it kind of came down to two things. One is, how do you all of a sudden, you know, throw back the curtains, go, ta-da, there's so much more without it being completely cheesy. But it was also the thought that the technocracy would not take people leaving lightly. The Sons of Ether caught them by surprise. But there's no way they wouldn't allow another well not tradition but another one of their conventions to leave without some serious payback without a serious vengeance mm. and initially in the books it was presented as you know they they pulled off the virtual apps pulled off a really great coup and they managed to get out wholesale untouched and the the story plot line was well what if they weren't untouched <laughs> So that's where that came from. And, I mean, while I came up with the idea, um, Gary Glass, by trade, he works in biochemistry. Um, so we had a, a lot of conversations about what it would look like and how it would operate and all sorts of fun things like that. So I want to make sure credit where credit is due. So Terry also says that when the Technocracy Revised books were written up, Alternative spheres were added, like data and probable energy. Was that idea around when you and Gary were writing this book? To be honest, I don't remember. <laughs> All right. um, well, that's fair enough. It's I, been some time. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's I do I I definitely mean I did go check back into my notes and it wasn't um. It wasn't something that was was in the notes, specifically as part of any of a mandate. Gotcha. So. All right. Well, Terry also noted that the first virtual adepts book had a lengthy section on trinary decks. Why was that skipped in the revised edition? Trinary decks were were a great reflection of um, the eighties and the nineties, and the question is is how can you get past that technology now that we had technology that was much closer to trinary decks even in the 2000s um what was the next generation like you know and i mean a lot of it is it kind of comes down to at some point your deck does not become a deck it's it's your imagination or it's your familiar or it's something that's that's completely unusual so trinary decks is weird as it sounds we're too limiting. Ah, interesting. All right. So one more question from Terry. This really gets into brass tacks. It's very specific. Do you have any idea why the tarot deck used in the book has a period at the end of the name? He says it's the only one that does that. That's funny. Um, <laughs> no, I... I you, I honestly don't, but I will tell you the first thing that came to mind. Okay. Um, and and this is absolutely I'm uh, I will bet you positive that I'm totally incorrect. <laughs> However, Grant Morrison at the end of um, uh, at the end of his seminal work, The Invisibles, um, talked about how um, uh, I think that the very last line was uh, they. They sentenced. They sentenced us. They trapped us. They sentenced us. Well, now our time is up, and the very last thing you see is a period. Ah, I don't know if that's true, but I like that explanation. Um, I know that that Phil's well uh, acquainted with um, with that particular <laughs> verse, and I know that that he does very much value that. Um, uh, that's Phil Bricado. I know he he values the that mage card specifically, um, so it wouldn't surprise me if because the for those folks who don't know because this is one of those wonderful weird things, uh, Grant Morrison wrote the Invisibles all three series um, as a giant invocation to simulate a, an abduction experience slash an initiation experience into magical mysteries. Well, it worked on me. So, um, <laughs> to 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 do that and to put that on the mage card uh, would would be a delightful way to tie that ritual into this, you know, and and would sound like something that somebody would would do just for fun among the mage crowd. <laughs> so, Bill, but the answer answer is no. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. okay. No, that's that's cool. So let me ask you this. What are you working on currently that you would like the listeners to know about and where is the best place to connect with you online? Um, currently I'm working on the new iteration of Fading Suns. Um, I am doing some small parts of it. I want to be clear on that because uh, it's a very big book and there are a lot of incredibly talented writers um, working under Bill Bridges for it. Um, where the core book's almost wrapped up, and I'm working on the second book, which has a lot of really incredible adventures. Um, other than that, I'm I work on a lot of short stories and in fiction components to get them out there in the world. I have a book which is looking for a publisher, <laughs> and uh, and that's always, always, always for any budding writers out there. That's that's the fun part: looking for publishers, looking for agents. And by fun, I mean mind-numbing tedium. But uh, <laughs> it is it is a part you got to get used to. Um, and the easiest way to contact me right now is um, I've got a Goodreads profile. I have a Facebook page under William Thomas Maxwell. Um, I absolutely have a website that is currently completely 100% down. And I'll be fixing that in the next <laughs> month. Uh, WTMaxwell.com. And if you go there right now, you'll go, oh, wow, his, his website's down. Yes, it is. <laughs> Well, Bill, I would love to have you back on the show to discuss anything mage related, and it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Pleasure speaking with you as well, and I'd love to All be right. back on. 
Fantastic. All right, everybody, join us again next week. Adam Simpson will return, and he will be bringing along our new co-host, Terry Robinson. Very excited about that. And they will be reviewing yet another Mage book. I can't wait. You can find us online at magethepodcast.com, and you can follow us on Twitter at magethepodcast, and you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and in the TuneIn app. Uh, Give us a review or rating on iTunes. It helps people find the show. For Mage the Podcast and Bill Maxwell, I'm Joseph Vallejo. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week.